Good morning, everyone. Oh, good morning, everyone. I, I am very sure. pleased, very pleased to to be in the company of Toby Usni, the co-authors of Connecting the Dots. Um, first, I'd like to thank New America. Um, they are uh, just just been a wonderful. We are we're part of the inaugural class of the US 250, and just would like to thank them for their support throughout this year. And this event is one of our culminating events. And I'm just very pleased to be here. We're here in Washington, D.C. I'd just like to just you know, turn it over to <laughs> Thank you, John. And Joe and I, who's here as well. Uh, Quinn, can I ask you to turn your camera off? I'm seeing that just as a... Okay. And hi, everyone. For those of you in the room, thanks for making the trek to New America Foundation. And my special thanks, not only to the foundation, but also to Joan and Jaha, who are co-founders of the Blanchard House Institute, which I'm proud to be associated with. And all of us coming together really is, I think of it as a kickoff for the beginning of celebrating the 250th anniversary of this country. And my co-author, Samir Kanuga, who's online with here with us here in Phoenix, he and I both are very much about connecting the dots, obviously having written it. But as it ties into this group and the work we do, it's about capacity building. How do you go out into the world and both build capacity, raise funds, raise followers, supporters for your organizations, your cause, but also to what end are you doing that, right? So for the 250th anniversary of this great country, which I'm proud to be a part of, we want to make sure that the next 250 years are engaged with civic-minded people such as yourself, um, as well as brands and businesses and young people coming up. We want to make sure that we're doing our part as best we can to steward America for the next 250 years. And that comes to civic engagement. So when we talk about connecting the dots, Yes, it's about building one's network, but it's also always in the back of my mind is to what end. And if you can think about what the end is, that's the legacy piece. So it makes you a lot better off going out into the world and connecting with people as we're doing here today. But also, in my view, it allows you to welcome incoming more that you might not know where your next partner is, where your next date is, where your next job opportunity is going to come because you're going to be getting all kinds of incoming. So with this book, we'd like to think that we're helping give people sort of a handbook or a guide to both welcome and go out into the world. So with that, shall I go ahead and get started? Uh, so we're gonna take you through a little 10 or so slide presentation, and then we will have a little dialogue with Jaha and me, and then we'll open it up to questions, okay? So, so here's the opening slide. I think everyone can see it, yes? Okay, so the fun part of this, well, again, we wanna thank our co-hosts, New America and Blanchard House Institute. And also we want to note a couple of anniversaries on the occasion of this launch, particularly in June. This is the 103rd year since the Tulsa race massacres, which we all know about in Tulsa or Greenwood, Oklahoma. And then the 100th anniversary of the Indian Citizenship Act. And perhaps Jaha and Joan will want to chime in a little bit on that later. All of which is part of the American history, which um, has, you know, the good and the bad in it. And Jaha is our moderator and me is one of your co-authors. So I should go back and just tell you that the cover art for this book, it's got two aspects I want to, well, three aspects I want to point out. First of all, uh, my co-pilot and co-author Samir is, uh, for those looking at the screen, is in the left and I'm on the right. This is when we're flying over Wichita, Kansas, conceiving of this book, which I'll tell you about in a minute. Uh, my husband Harlan is in the back seat there. He's always the wind beneath my wings and I want to give him a shout out today, but he's not a co-author, so he's in the back seat. Uh, and if you look at the artwork superimposed above, that's actually a map of the United States. And so as the story goes, Samir came into my life and Harlan's life 17 years ago when Harlan and I were both pilots. We bought a little Cessna Skyhawk in California, a single engine prop. And we are not instrument rated. We are what's called VFR, visual flight rules. So we were able to actually fly in nice weather. But if there's clouds or thunder or storms, we are not instrument rated. So we could not legally fly through that. So the broker, uh, Baron Thomas, who sold us the plane, hooked us up with this young Indian American MBA student named Samir Kanuga, who met us in Van Nuys Airport in his little tie and, and, and um, suit to fly us back two days across America. We flew, but he was there as our safety pilot. He's been in our life ever since. He's now 17 years later in happily uh, Indian arranged marriage, a very traditional marriage, amazing wife puja, three adorable kids, he and his parents, his brother, have been in our life since. We've taken vacations together. So that same flight east, we recreated on the way west this fall when we were selling the plane 17 years later. And the dots on that map that we stopped to refuel along the way are what's superimposed on the, the cover of the book. So literally, figuratively, we're connecting the dots. And as we're writing the book and as we're flying over Kansas, Samir 
asked me all these years later, he got his MBA. He's a CFO of a company. He's very happily married, wonderful family. He asks me, Tobe, I watched you all these years. How do you network? Like, tell me how you do it. And I said, Samir, why don't you just put your iPad down? I said, why don't we write a book together? And we'll use generative AI to be sort of testing out the technology and we'll write a book about networking. And so it's done within four months. These are our ideas, our concepts, our heavy, heavy editing. We did use AI along the way. And also I would say that, you know, we're big tech people. We we like to engage with the technology. And I think it's important to, particularly with AI, to be conversant in, because that's how we can shape where it goes or where it doesn't go. Mm-hmm. So um, that is the story of connecting the dots. So um, why networking matters? I think to some people, the word networking is a disturbing word. It, it sounds dirty or calculated or commercial. And I get that. I take that on. That's not how Samir and I approach it. We approach it about how do you build your own personal network to the ends that you are seeking to advance higher purpose, right? So whether it's John and Jaha, Blanchard Institute, New America, and what they're doing, that's what we mean in terms of network. How do you build uh, support, collaboration, followers for your efforts in life? That's not to say that business people aren't going to use it to build sales, but that's not the only way in which networking comes to play. So as you can see here on the screen, I mean, it is, it's critical. Networking is essential for success in today's world like it or not, whether you're a a minister or a teacher, you've got to have a robust network to help you navigate all the challenges and opportunities that come our way. Uh, It can also unlock opportunities that you might not know or see. That's kind of the Samir and Toby story when we met. And of course, you're always going to find surprises, little aha moments or uh uh-oh moments, right? It's good and bad, but you're always going to discover new sort of insights. And that could be fun. It can be important and valuable. Boosting your skills. Uh, We were having a little conversation before we came on here about young people and how they go out and use social media today. Are they learning oral skills, presentation skills? Are they learning eye contact? Are they going to be equipped to lead the world that we hope that they will? So boosting your skills is a great sidebar or side product of networking. And then finally, just another highlight that we talk about in the book is mentors and champions. Um, Until you go out and test your hypotheses or go out into the world and think about what it is you're meant to do and how you're going to go about doing it and with whom, um, you're not really going to have the team you need. So that can mean mentors, champions. It can also just be supporters, funders, followers, the policymakers. That's all part of the, uh, the process of the impact that comes with networking. So we think of this book as a handbook, a guide. It's whatever you want it to be. I will tell you, I was thinking about this yesterday. I probably spend at least an hour or more a day helping other people out, career coaching, networking. It's all gratis, but that's kind of just who I am. But after 61 years on this planet, I realize people come to me that for a reason. I think I'm trustworthy. I have a network. I can help. I, I'm a nice, approachable person. I'm actually trending on social media right now under my TikTok account for Fun Uncle Toby or Funkle Toby. I'm about to hit a million this week for my first impression because... I give good advice, life advice, career advice. I think that's why people are coming to me. This book is kind of going to test that and see if it's um, what I would hope with this book for all those you that are here today, but also who buy the book and hopefully like it and comment favorably, is that I'm only one person. I only have so many hours. So for me, and I think for Samir, the book is a way to at least help scale in a sense our message and the lessons we've learned because I can't take that much time in an above what I'm already doing. So I'd like to say at a minimum, we'll read my book and then we can talk, right? Because it really is about the network, but more importantly about the purpose piece. So I think of it as a guidebook. It's for you to decide. It is for definitely, it's very practical. We give examples of what success looks like. We give celebrity fueled examples that people can relate to. We look at different generations throughout the book and how there are relatable stories and people in every aspect of the book. And we try and do a few questions at the end of each chapter to help people think about how it's relevant to their own world. This being my second book, I can tell you there are formulas to writing the book. So there's nothing groundbreaking here with this, but we do find that um, that sort of reflective set of questions at the end of each chapter is a, is a way to help people catalyze or apply what they're reading in that chapter. You'll see here then emphasis from Samir and me, and I'll just nail it real quickly here for you. It's about building trust and authenticity. Whether you're analog or digital, whether you're 15 or 55, trust is everything. Uh, I've been trained in my career as a media relations person about the R and PR, the relationship piece, and your truth is everything, right? If you lie, you misrepresent, 
you're going to lose trust, right? So we talk about that in the book. We also talk about how you can try and rebuild trust if you have done it. But I want people, Samir and I want people to just think about that concept of trust and how do we go out into the world, whether we're trying to sell a product or support a candidate for public office or teach a kid the difference between right and wrong. Trust is everything. Um, that's the gold standard. The power of diversity, that's something we also believe strongly. We ourselves are diverse. I'm a gay man. Uh, Samir is Indian American. We come from very different backgrounds in a certain sense, but we unite over the messages in this book. But above and beyond that, in our own lives, in our own world, in our own jobs, when we go out into the world, we're trying to really embrace that concept of DEI and catalyzing it with who we work, how we, who, how do we share our platform, and with whom? Are we really open to being critiqued or challenged? And so that's a theme that's woven throughout the book, and there's a chapter dedicated to it. Later on, I'll show you some. I'll give you an outline of the chapters. And then the leveraging of technology, we've talked about the AI piece. I have to say it's been super fun um, between both screen, uh, sorry, the cloud and collaborating real time with Samir. Our routine became sort of like every Monday morning, we would have an hour. He's in Arizona, God bless him. So at my 9 a.m., it's like 7 a.m. He's up before the kids wake up going online with us. I see one little chat here. Let me make sure I'm not missing anything. Hi, Ulrich. Welcome. Ulrich is a Clinton Global Initiative friend of ours. So the next slide is aligning. So this book is relevant to, I think, everyone in this room and everyone logged on. But since we're being hosted by New America, I thought it would be appropriate and respectful and, and show gratitude by mentioning how this book can be helpful to, to New America and aligning one's goals with theirs because we are looking at the... U.S.'s 250th anniversary and challenge me here. I think it's uh, semi-quincentennial, yeah. right? So I'm learning to say that, right? So 2026, get ready and use that big fancy word. And so I'm a big believer in the work that New America is doing. I'm proud to be American. I want to do my part. My book is, our book is a part of that, but also in my volunteerism and the things I do every day, it's the same. So um, it's about building relationships here, particularly with policymakers in D.C., the nation's capital civic leaders, getting people engaged, civic-minded engagement. It's about mobilizing communities around your cause, your your whatever it is you're on this planet to do. How do you get capacity? Um, strong networks are going to be a huge way of empowering both civic leaders, uh, candidates, people running for public office around important issues, right? I, that's why I keep talking about higher purpose. You know when you're in the presence of it. This is not, you know, I like candy, so I want to get more chocolate. It's it's more like a higher purpose, like getting candidates in office or getting young people educated for the 21st, 22nd century. And then promoting that civic engagement. I think you all may have heard of the book called Bowling Alone that came out maybe 20 years ago and how everything is down in terms of civic engagement from Boy Scouts to to everything, P PTAs, parent-teacher associations. And, and we... That kind of civic engagement is what built this country. That's how I was raised with my family. Also, so we're trying to be our do our part in keeping that top of mind, particularly as we're going into the anniversary. Put your hand up, lean in, ask questions, make yourself available. Don't just swipe left, swipe right. Right, really like go deep, have the conversation, pick that higher cause. This is just the. This literally is the table of contents from the book, and I mentioned at the beginning the the map. So this is the map. Uh, where we flew coming from Kingston, New York, all the way over. Harlan and I took turns flying with Samir in the in the co-pilot seat until we got to Phoenix where we sold the plane. So we thought that would be a really great visual of connecting dots. And then the various chapters in there. So as I mentioned, you'll see some things like DE and I we have a full uh, chapter on, but just to sort of nail it real quickly, we start with the introduction and then the intergenerational views. So we look at the demographics that we all know of today from Gen Z, Gen X, millennials, alpha, the traditionalists, they're all in there. Of what are commonly understood demographics and uh, traits that are attributed to these different definitions. We're actually the first time in history because of life expectancy, we have four generations working together in the workplace. And so we either, if we have hair, some of us want to pull it out. If we don't, we still want to kind of like stare down or fix blame elsewhere and you can do that, but then to what end, right? So our book, I think, is a way to help people understand where others might be coming from and some of the tools that one can use to interact with different generations, different demographics in the workplace. For example, we'll talk about the Myers-Briggs, if anyone's done those exams, or the colors process for uh, inventorying psychological or psychological inventory to help you better understand how people at your office or workplace might be 
different than you and how to interact with them. Chapter on uh, connecting. So it talked a little bit about incoming, what the universe sends us, and then outgoing. So mixing chapter three is really about welcoming anyone and everything that comes into your reality. And then chapter four is matching. That's once you have a sense of what you might be on this planet to do, how can you more strategically, more responsibly go out, whether it's through LinkedIn or through a social club or through your office, to connect with like-minded people who are going to help you advance that um, that mission or that purpose. Diversity chapter, we talked about trust. I've also mentioned, we talked about that at length, the gold standard. Um, barometers of trust, this is a particularly interesting thing for the younger readers because there are things I've observed and Samir has observed that are, for better or for worse, really go to resources for people, particularly young people. So things like horoscopes, right? Or uh, dating apps. And we even talk about faith communities. A lot of people draw strong, um, uh, I'll say, influence from their communities of faith. I'm raised Catholic, not practicing, but I still identify proudly as Catholic and faith means something to me. But it's also what we talk about in the book is that you're still the captain of your destiny. You can have faith and you can uh, you know, believe in and pray to a higher source, but you're still in charge of what you do each day. So that faith is not an excuse not to do something. It's a, a tool or a, a way to be who you are, but in a way that's not off, uh, let's just say, is not deflecting responsibility for your actions and how you go out into the world. So that's some examples of the barometers of trust cross-checking. Um, I should point out here that because we're both pilots, Samir and I use the piloting narrative throughout the book. So cross-check is what you do when you're you're both getting the plane ready or when you're in air, you're constantly scanning the horizon, scanning your, your instruments, altitude, speed, you name it. So same thing applies with your, your reputation and the network that you build. Are you keeping it fresh? Are you doing your part? Are you really keeping it relevant to who you are and what you're meant to do. We talk a little bit about, you know, there are sometimes it's, oh, it's perfectly fine to let a relationship go just so you're doing it knowingly and responsibly, right? But if you're not really cultivating and investing and cross-checking your relationships in your career or in your life, then your network is probably going to be less than optimal. And as a result, your legacy, the lives you touch, the impact you have, the ripple effect is going to be diminished as well. So this is more like a muscle where you can exercise it and get better or not, because we're all humans. We're all going out into the world. We're all using technology and analog type events, but to what end? So that's the legacy piece for me always. To what end are you doing what you're doing? So cross-checking is key to making sure those relationships are nurtured and strong. Networking the digital age would talk about some of the, um, the apps that are out there like Blink or uh, LinkedIn. And then um, tools in the toolbox, a variation on that. Um, and an old school is something for me as someone who came up <laughs> where thank you notes mattered, handwritten thank you notes, stationery mattered, birthday cards, Christmas card mattered. Um, they still do. But that's not to say that it's the only way to, you know, celebrate someone's anniversaries or their graduation. So we look at both the American Greetings digital cards, which can bring a lot of joy and delight to people. Uh, as well as an old school handwritten card. I mean, I'm sure everyone in the room would say that if you do get mail at home, whatever is a handwritten note with a stamp on it from someone you recognize or think you might be recognized, that's always going to be the first thing you're going to open, right? It's not the junk mail um, because someone made the effort to actually go that distance, right? So just that little bit of more effort to get the stamp the card, write it means a lot. You don't have to do it all the time. But I promise you that when you do blend the old school and the new school, your message, your intention is going to pop more than anyone else's, right? So we talk about some of those uh, tricks here. Um, and then the power of networking. This is the whole legacy piece, which um, I hope you are all thinking about what you're on this planet to do and how you're going about doing it. I know that you are. And I'd like to think that this book will help you do it even more. So those are the broader themes. Um, the more actionable tips, these are some of them here. A lot of people are fearful of speaking public or networking. So that's why we always talk about starting small and be strategic. You don't. You can be an introvert. You still got to have a network, right? So if, and we talk about this in the book, there are ways to go out um, and test your abilities to network. Um, you don't have to go to the biggest events in your industry. You don't have to do anything other than just contact one person on LinkedIn to try and build your network, right? So start small. I'm not a big fan of big declarative statements here on the occasion or the launch of this new book, but but you have to start somewhere. But um, but better to just make the conscious effort to go out and network knowingly 
versus saying, oh, I'm going to go out and network. I'm going to, you know, get 100,000 followers by whatever. I think that's part of the challenge with the younger social media driven generation that digitally led organizations is that they equate numbers too readily with influence or uh, success. And it's more about, in our opinion, it's more about the quality of those connections and those relationships and how you maintain them. And are they two way? Are you just taking, right? Transactional stuff has its place. But we're trying to get to the higher purpose where, yes, you can, like Joan and Jaha have been in my life for a long time now, Joan in particular. What started out as friends back in the day when she was working with World Economic Forum is transcended all these years later. Same thing with Samir. So the universe brings us together, and then what do you do with it? Sometimes there'll be those that you want us to keep in longer for reasons that you're advancing the narrative is what I talk about in life. Um, if you're going to live in the past, I have a college roommate here with us today who's still in my life all these years later, because when Jeff and I get together, it's not just about living in the past when we were roommates in Paris, right? It's everything, the rock star work he's doing for the forestry service in the United States and his advocacy work and my work, we, we keep in each other's lives for all the right reasons. <laughs> uh, so going back uh, to that earlier point, you, you can't just be a giver, right? Like I get... As I said earlier, I'm probably asked, every day I'm asked to talk to someone about something. And now that I'm hitting a million on TikTok, oddly enough, it's coming in in droves. So how do you, but I will still try and help people, but an excuse the crass uh, sort of parallel, but I say to people like, you need a little foreplay here. <laughs> like, like you just don't show up and say, can you do this for me? Because I typically would, but it's quite insulting. And you take note if someone only asks for things when they want something and conversely, I try not to ask someone to help out unless I'm willing to do the same for them or I can make it relevant and helpful to them as well. So to be a giver, not just a taker and do it randomly. Like I, I will, if I see something that reminds me of someone or some moment in time, I will share that just to say, hey, you know, fun flashback photo that just got popped up by the algorithm or remember when we were doing this and this made me think of you or check out this op-ed piece. And then following up, this is the whole nurturing of the relationships, which I know everyone on this call and in this room does. So the legacy piece we've talked about, it's about uh, fueling your personal professional growth, doing it with others. That's how you're going to really, you can go from looking like this to this, the more you can grow your network to think outside their usual suspects. I talk in the book about three dots of connection. So the transactional are, oh, I've got a book, Jai has a publishing company, let's get together. That's very clear. That's transactional. But then you think about all the other great things that Jaha is, does, and cares about, including Blanchard Institute. And of course, I'm excited about the kind of work you're doing with the Heritage Trail and other stuff. So we're continuing to collaborate in other ways, not just that two dots of connection of publishing a book. And so if you have three dots of connection with someone, you're also more likely to be able to both keep that relationship nurtured and rich, but also it's going to allow you to then help that person connect with more like-minded people, whether they also went to the same college as you or they also love Jack Russell Terriers or rescue animals. I mean, there's so many different ways to, to see and get to know a person. It's much more human-centered. It's another reason why I'm quite optimistic about the future of AI. I believe as a liberal arts and science grad, as a, as a lifelong learner, that AI is never going to replace what we have as human beings because we connect dots in our minds in a way that a computer can't. Computers can only recreate what's been known or done before, but the mind is wild with creativity and you put two connected minds together with those common points of interest and then you multiply it it's it's hugely exciting and i think it's it's a way to keep us both uh, vibrant in our minds and, and in our networks that and also i love the serendipitous part of this you just never know like i can ride on the subway in new york i love new york i'm never leaving new york i think it's the greatest city on earth but i still i do get out but to be riding on the subway in new york and run someone you haven't seen i ran into jane levere a new york times reporter a couple of weeks ago, I hadn't seen in a very long time. And I was going uptown from a, an event and we just caught up then and then we're able to see some other stories and things that couldn't have happened, right? So the geographic proximity, the physical proximity really matters as well. So make sure you're not just living on a screen for sure. And then again, so these can be sources of support and encouragement, particularly when you don't feel like you have it. You can find your posse of supporters elsewhere. Active listening, even though I'm doing all the talking here today, I really am trying to practice it. Those who know me best know that I do talk. I tend to talk fast. I tend to fill the void of someone else. But how powerful is the listener, really? I'm actually always intrigued at the person who speaks last or who just listens and reads the room in, in meetings and conversations. 
I admire that. I'm trying to practice that. Um, I'm trying with active listening to ask in really insightful questions, incisive questions. And so we talk about that in the book. It's about definitely taking an active interest in the other person, but also that means asking really good questions that you're really eager to hear the response to. Not formulaic, like, oh, tell me about your childhood. No, like, tell me what it was like growing up as a refugee in Algeria kind of stuff. Which I have a podcast where I get to do those kinds of deep conversations with incredibly diverse people. So I'm trying to be the active listener while asking those questions. So that's a key part of going beyond just sort of the handshake here. Finding common ground, we need that more than ever here at the New America Foundation. The work that Joan and Jaha are doing at Blanchard House Institute, we've got to build bridges and find common ground as we go into probably what will be the most decisive and divisive election in the history of the United States. When I think, how could it get worse than it was before? But here we are, right? So I, I'm all for people getting out and supporting their candidates and voting. And I'm all for not just looking at the top two, but everything down below. But that's got to be a collaborative effort. We have to find common ground. So elections are just one example, but pick any issue you care about, whether it's climate or or organic farming, try and actually get to know those who have a different view or a different approach and, and actively listen and agree to what you can agree upon and work from there. The three examples I always give to people, I'll give you two. I don't think this is in the book, but if you're trying to find common ground, if you are an animal nut like I am, people aren't going to ask you if you're Republican or Democrat, if you love Jack Russell's or Dachshunds, right? Like that's all they're going to care about. Music, right? You go to Burning Man, as I've done a few times, or you go to Coachella or you go to Carnegie Hall to hear Beethoven Symphony. People aren't asking you for your voter registration card. They're not really noting your color or your ethnicity. What they want to know is, do you share the same love of that music or the animal? And it's sports, right? Like if you're a Yankees fan, which I am, you're fine with any other Yankees fan. You might have a little bit more to say with the Red Sox, but, but Fandom is a great place to start when you're trying to find common ground. And so as we think about the 250th anniversary, I try to think about how much is great in this country and how much we share and how much uh, we have to celebrate versus taking each other down. A little fun rivalry is not a bad thing. Though. And then uh, storytelling, I think when you can personalize things and, and deliver the message, that's really helpful because it's putting your vulnerability out there a bit. It's letting down your guard a bit to let people kind of see the human side of it. But it also makes it more relevant. So if you're an artist or storyteller, sometimes it's a way to really help build your network uh, and body language, right? Like I always tease people to sit like this and they know to, my husband likes to, when I do this, he tries out Toby Toby. I say, you can't out Toby Toby. So sometimes you really do want to just sit like this and relax and listen, right? It's not a closed body thing, but body language matters. And again, you can't really pick that up in a digital way in the same way that you can in person. So these are just some of the sort of tips and, and eye contact. My gosh, I say to my friends whose kids are young and trying to find a way, just make sure they wait tables or bus tables or do some kind of service industry job where they have to look at people in the eye and they have to think fast on their feet and they have to be service oriented because that is, I think, it's one of the greatest skills my brothers and I ever got from our parents. We were caddying, waiting tables, busing tables, and of course, making cash, which was super fun. But um, these things matter for both, you know, body language, certainly the eye contact, but also just building your flexibility and nimbleness on the go. Can't swipe left, swipe right when your customer wants, you know, the hamburger done better. Leveraging the power of technology, uh, just a couple more slides here. You know, we're trying to, by using AI, we're trying to really showcase how AI is not good or bad. It just is. So how do you use it? And this has been a really fun collaboration for Samir and me. Who knows what comes next, but I feel like there's more to be done with this. And then using these things responsibly, ethically, I think it's really important for parents to follow up as everything. I make it a point for young people to understand the tools that they're using and how powerful they are and how much they're using them, right? Joan was saying earlier today about her son, who we won't name names, but he's not using a social at all, really. And he's the one everyone wants to know, right? Like, they can't find him online. Like, wow, it makes you want to know more. But he has seen his peer group, as I understand. I've heard this from other friends as well. Like, And you know about these tech parents in California who aren't letting their kids on the social media. They know what they have brought, right? So 
I think it's it's good to at least ask yourselves and your family: Are we using this responsibly? Do we are we inculcating with our kids the kind of uh, responsible use of technology that we need and want? That's why I'm trying to get more people to engage with AI because we're the ones that are going to shape where it goes. So if you have good, responsible citizens like all of those on this call today, very bullish about how the technology can evolve and be a force for good. It can be another way of celebrating the next 250th anniversary of the United States, the semi-quincentennial, now that I can say it twice. Also, it does create more fun. I mean, I have to say the, the mind goes like this when you're collaborating with AI, with someone who shares your values and your project. It can only make that collaboration more efficient, more effective, and more exciting you, of course, will be the judges when you read the book. So you saw the cover shot. You can check, uh, just grab the screen bar here if you want for my QR code. But throughout this book, it has been definitely about building capacity, building one's network, but also I can't emphasize enough the legacy piece. To what end are you doing what you do every day? I care desperately that you all came here today, that you're curious at least about the book and want to know more. You know me, you know Samir, but this is our hope that you will take this and use it to your advantage because we know that you are going to use it responsibly and it can only help doers, catalytic thinkers and doers like yourselves, be even more catalytic and do more great things here on the eve of the semi-quincentennial of the United States. And also, as I say, stay connected, nurture that. If you want, you can be in touch here. And if you like the book, please give it a great review on Amazon. We did see last night, we're live, so thank Yay. you, Cha, <laughs> uh, my publisher and friend. And um, we'll be working on an audio, audible version later this year and a digital version. So with that, I'm going to stop and check. We have one comment in the chat here, I think. Over to you, Jaha. So my first question is, what inspired you to write a book about networking disability? I think, well, two things. One, it was Samir just asking me about networking when we were flying over Wichita, which is actually where the Cessnas are manufactured. So it was a fun kind of, we took our baby home and then took her off to Phoenix where we sold her for twice that we paid for it. So when he asked me about it, that's where I thought about, you know, doing something collaboratively with him. But also, as I mentioned, I do so much career coaching as I know you do. You want to help. You were helped. I was helped. You want to play it forward. But there's only so much time in a day. So for us, it was very much about how can we scale this? And the book is the way we've done that. You know, one thing you mentioned earlier about those having like three dots. When I was in Micronesia, I actually worked uh, with an HR company for seven years. And we would do, we would sometimes have a few weeks of people. We have to pretty much get them in a different set of traits than they had. Let's say they had had a certain degree of traits that have led them to life that wasn't like they wanted. So I said, I had new captain for this amount of time, what we're going to do. And what we did, I had dislocated workers. I mean, I just had a bunch of different types of people. I had older people who were transitioning to some other time. There's a lot of different things. But what I found that every time we had a group where people shared what their real gifts and dreams were, and there were one having that question, who am I being asked of them? And then having people share in this. And then when people actually know this, one, they then know what, what they're saying maybe they want to do with it. It may or may not correlate to who they actually are. Those friends become what we call critical friends mm -hmm. in that they hold you to who you are. And what we found they tell me they make 100% of the time we made in circles. If someone needed something, someone else in that group could help answer that question and literally would have that resource. But it took them actually being authentic and sharing who they were for people to know how they can actually help them. And I think that's part of it for doing too, is sharing people to actually not be afraid to show your light mm. because it inspires, you know, you're sharing your world, which also inspires others. Yeah. Uh, agreed. Uh, two thoughts about that. One, and Samir uh, took on this part of the book, which I love. Yeah, we look at different personality traits and one of them is the oversharer. Mm -hmm. We know when we're in the presence of them. So yes, share in a trust. You have to have some boundaries, particularly in the workplace about what do you share and, and how do you share it? And is it what we call Chatham House rules? Is it, you know, is it uh, going to stay within that room? Those things matter. And it's for the manager and the participants to agree to what the terms of engagement are, because you're talking about people's lives and their passions and their fears and concerns. And then the second thing I would say is I'm on a number of different nonprofit boards or organizations, and I uh, have built organizations. And so what I talk about with leaders in those organizations and members, but I also now talk about with individuals such as the readers of this book is building your own sounding board. So that's what I, I call the sounding board. Yes. These are usually informal, 
but they need to have some formality to it. So if you're reinventing yourself in your next career move, ask yourself, who would I want to be on my sort of board of advisors, my sounding board? And how do I go out and ask them for advice? And then formalize it in a way you don't like knight them with a sword necessarily. You could. But it's important that they know that you think of them this highly, this importantly, and that you are going to be leaning on them at least somewhere between three and four times a year. It could be for coffee, for phone call, a check-in. And it might be with all of them together. It might be one-on-one. -on -one. But it's important for you to let them know that you respect them and their opinion so much and that you're going to be coming to them as you move forward on this, this mission or this project that you're working on. And the other thing I would say about that, it, we're in Washington, D.C. today. And it is the capital of the United States, but it's also the headquarters for every nonprofit organization, right? Yes. Like whether it's chemistry society or teachers or AFL-CIO or organic farmers, they all have a presence here, no matter who's in the White House. And those associations matter. They, they represent the interests of their members and they're important. But I think sometimes we, we give a little bit too much of ourselves to those organizations and we give away some control of what we need as professionals and as citizens. So I think sometimes for an organization, it's better build your own sounding board versus paying a membership due to go belong to this organization or that organization. You know, I'm a member of the AOPA, the Aircraft, Aircraft Owner Pilot Association, Shoreham, the Society of Human Resource Management. We've done some things with their important associations. Some of them are going to give you what you need, when you need it, how you need it. Some of them, you're just going to have that seal of approval on your CV or your LinkedIn. But is it really working for you? So I think it's important to ask ourselves regularly, are we are we associated with the associations and the individuals we need, or do we need to kind of build our own sounding board, our own network? And so I've done that in my career with something called ArtsCom. It's a, a start out small as a group of communications and marketing officers when I was head of communications at Christie's. And I went out one by one with my friend, Mary Trudell from the Wallace Foundation. And we built, first we brought the Met Museum in and then Carnegie Hall and then the Guggenheim. And now 17 years later, Artscom is thriving with 76 members, including six foundations who fund the arts, including Bloomberg Philanthropies and the Arcos. And, and we are what started out as this informal sounding board of people who wanted to talk about advancing culture, preserving, celebrating culture in the New York area to the next generation of culture seekers. But we, as the communications and marketing folks in our institutions were kind of odd ducks. We were the expense items. We were not the general revenue generators. So I, to this day, still think of Artscom as the odd duck convention where the odd ducks come together and they quack and they address the things that matter. Like, what are you doing with COVID? What are you doing with Black Lives Matter? What are you doing with decolonize this place? They, what are you doing with AI versus blogging? We've been together 17 years. We're a trusted group that started out as a sounding board, but it's more relevant to what we need to do as professions in the arts and cultural communication space in a place called New York. We all have that ability to create those sounding boards in our own lives and our own organizations. So rather long-winded, Jaha, way of saying I'm with you. I agree with that. <laughs> but take, take ownership of it, right? Yes. You, you know, uh, Glenn and I read a session earlier today and it was speaking about, and this is the bill we're on this, about how a lot of the philanthropic community, due to everyone will march in the same line, has gotten into the mode of managing problems rather than solving them. And that's just become the thing. And so going with your saying is that if you don't have that group of people, let's say of, of critical friends that you stay on top of things, change may actually be happening and you're not with the change and there still need to be change leaders. And I think the way that you one keep your, your personal as well as professional relevance is still being dynamic. And so yes, you belong to organizations because they'll have their things, but they you yourself, there's there's a truth to you that that's a change with time and, and use of maybe I need to do a little different right. idea. And also who you want to have, you know, quotes in your network. And, you know, I spoke, you know, you, I was writing something down when you were talking. The thing about networks, networks, I'd say, is that if one is sincere with who they are, your life, you're living your own own belief all of it. And in sharing your life and assisting others, honestly, the networking comes, it's, it's not this dirty thing that you think. It's simply just being you, you know, yourself, simply sharing yourself and genuinely assisting others. You know? Yeah. And then those those connecting the dots, that's how you're going to really test that. Like, is this really who I am or is it who I say I am? Is this who I want to be? And as you build those friendships and those voices, that sounding board, people are going to say like, oh, you're so full of bulls, Jaha, that is not you. 
or conversely, when you're when you're nailing it, people are going to know two things. They're going to know like, wow, I need this guy on my team or wow, I got to get out of his way, right? Because this is the real deal. And also I tell people if, if you're clear on who you are and what you're meant to do and people that you are, are networked with see that, they're going to remember that narrative later. I use that old game of telephone where you say something to one person and he or she repeats it because by the time it gets down here, like nobody knows what the original message was. But when your sense of purpose, like I, I, my purpose is making a difference through daily discovery and adventure. So this book has been that adventure. I'd like to think it's making a difference. It's full of discovery. But that has always been who I've been, who I am and who I will be. So it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. But people will remember that when I'm not in the room. The other thing I would say that I really agree with you on is, um, you know, the solutions to problems are often there. We just aren't open to seeing them or receiving them. So particularly young people, n nobody's cornered the market on good ideas, right? So the more diversity you have in your sounding board, in your network, the better prepared you are going to be at least exercising possible solutions to it. And that's where AI comes in. I'm telling you, you can sit home alone at two o'clock in the morning trying to be like, oh my God, what's my purpose, right? But with AI, you can have that iter of conversation and it will pull in the university, the universe fairly standard questions, answers, tests to use. So would that also be a way to, I'd say, reach a generation that we've, I would almost say we've raised them to be solid system people, say feelings only matter, nothing else matters, but we actually also depend on them to read the future, which what means if they're only satisfied with their own ideas and people sound like them, it's kind of like a doomed situation. So maybe what you're saying now, if one were to use AI just to be able to even give you, because Technology is trusted. If you say, you know, can you give me all the perspectives on this problem? That may be a way of maybe using AI to at least open perspectives. So just like that. Yes. And the other thing, you know, when you say for a generation, it's not one demographic even um, to, to say feelings matter. I would turn to that person and say, well, well, whose feelings, right? Like once you can ask whose feelings, is it just yours? Then you kind of know to what end you're asking, right? Yes. Is that transactional? Is that fair? Is that respectful? You know, we hear a lot now about microaggressions, and it's an interesting thing. Is an LGBTQ man who fought for marriage equality and has been out most of my life. It's the concept of diversity means different things to different people. So that right there is a great conversation starter, and you could test drive it with AI. If you're afraid to ask someone like, do I have to say black or African American? Well, I'm comfortable in my own skin asking that of someone if I don't know the answer. But you can ask that in AI and get a pretty standard universal response. So I think sometimes just asking the question is halfway to the solution versus not thinking of it. Does that make sense? Oh, it, it does. You know, you maybe think it's about something. So at Dartmouth, you just New Hampshire primaries first. All the candidates come, she meet them all. And what, what was so good is that at least until now, it's still this way that, that no one's protesting like people that they don't want to hear yet. But what was beautiful is that you're actually able to hear perspectives which you never, ever would have considered in life. And, and, and that person's speech is going to test your, your, you know, pretty much what you believe. It either is going to hold up or it's not. And that's, I think, that's what we should seek in life is that continuous improvement should be our goal rather than simply being satisfied with what I am right now, the understanding that we're getting better and better as who we are in time. Absolutely. And also, I would add to that, Ja, I think I'm just thinking about everything today on a spectrum, Right from gender to autism to politics. Life is not binary like our politicians too often and our media too often want us to believe and to take sides. And that's not American. The American way has, I think, largely been about live and let live. Don't shout fire in a theater, but otherwise go about your life. And we need to be reminded of that regularly, particularly our young people, particularly here on the occasion of the semi-quincentennial of the United States. Like that's what made this country great. It's about yeah. growth and opportunity, but it's also not only your own, right? It's yes. the collective. It's showing up and building the post office or the highways. And we've got it. So this is something on that note. So on that note, I find younger generations are very much geared on leaving a positive impact. But I, I don't think we've done a good enough job in terms of saying that that actually has an impact, not just an identity. Yeah. And kind of like, you know, I guess how, what can we do through this process or through technology to 
help them reflect to differentiating that simply having identity of a good person is not enough. That we really actually have to have a, a good impact on other people's lives. Yeah. Well, I, the funny tale of that, if you ask a young person often, like, what do you want to be when you grow up? They'll say famous. That's, that's a non answer. <laughs> so you want to be a positive impact, but that's also, I think, respectfully a non answer. Positive impact on what? Like, yes. what are the, what's your declared goal or what does success look like? And how do you measure, monitor? How do you hold yourself accountable? How are you holding other people accountable to that same reality? I love that that's where they want to go, and I'm supportive of that. But it's an iterative process, and as you know, it's a lifelong process, right? What I can say is with every setback I've had in life, my joy right now more than ever, including this book, is A, I have my sense of purpose, right? I'm declared purpose. You make a difference, daily discovery and adventure. And B, I know that time is the most precious thing we have, so I do not waste it. So one could say, well, you spent an hour on a phone with some stranger who asked you something. But for me, that's on mission for me. And that's the ripple effect. I don't know where, when, or how it will come back to me. But I know that the universe will send that back. Or if it doesn't send it back to me, it's going to go out in a positive way. And where it gets really kind of seismic is when you know you don't even need to receive the affirmation or the proof of it. I know, for example, that this is the greatest country on earth and it is worth fighting for. So uh, friends that'll say, oh, we're going to move to Portugal. If this doesn't go this way or whatever. I'm like, I'm not leaving this country ever. I And I fly the American flag. Harlan and I fly it on our barn. I mean, the flag doesn't belong to anybody. It belongs to all of us, right? So I, I don't need to be proven right on that. I know that, right? And... So I had a friend last weekend, we were putting a banner up, campaign banner up, and we had our flag. And she said, oh, I'm so glad to see you took back the flag because I'm afraid to fly mine now. I think people might assume certain things. I said, this is our flag. <laughs> like, you, of course you should love it and fly it proudly. And don't let others tell you what it is or what it isn't. It's our country, right? So I put that out there because to me, it's evident, right? But have a dialogue with that, as I did with this woman, because I think now she's flying her flag again, as she should. So, you, so you're going to a place also that, you know, as a teacher and visits, there are no vacuums. When we retreat from dialogue, something else fills that. And that thing that fills it may or may not be what you want to see. And so it's actually through that. So on that note, you know, this book's about networking. Who, I say, what networkers have really impressed you and been models for you in terms of helping shape the way that you approach life? Yeah, I have um, two sort of heroes of late that I've been citing. One past, one is still alive. And it comes up because most of my my husband, my peer group are older than me, and they are either voluntarily or involuntarily moving toward retirement. I just, I'm going to go until I drop because I'm my purpose and my work are so aligned. I, how do you blur the... I, my, everything I do is useful, great use of my time and advanced my mission. So I'm never stopping, right? The idea of going to the golf community and retiring, I do like to golf, but I'm not going to be that person. But the two examples I cite of my sort of uh, elder statesman, one was Vernon Jordan, a great, great American citizen who did work until he passed. And he was always the behind the scenes guy. Like most Americans probably wouldn't know who Vernon Jordan is, and maybe they will now Google it and see. But what an elegant go-to person, right? Like I only met him twice. He's on the board at American Express when I was there. And then I ran him years later at uh, Lazard when he was working there. And just to shake his hand and say, thank you. Like I'm just in awe of you. And the other is Gloria Steinem, who just turned 90. She could not look greater than ever. This woman has done more for women in this country, I think, in the world than people realize. And she's not stopping, right? So to me, their networks must be the Rolodexes that one would covet, right? Like who wouldn't want to sit down with Gloria today or who wouldn't have with Vernon Jordan in the past? So that's for me, examples of networks to admire. Awesome. So before we go to questions, you, you have to share any other thoughts about the book before we move to that next section? Actually, one la just trailing on that last question, Samir and I came across a nice New York Times or Wall Street Journal article about uh, David Rockefeller Sr., his his celebrated Rolodex. Um, and uh, some people know I'm fairly friendly with Sue and David Rockefeller. Sue's given a nice mention in the back of the book. But the article in the journal was about Mr. Rockefeller's Rolodex, which is, and you'll see it in the book. It is astonishing how pre-digital, pre-like, Palm Pilot and 
pre Google, he was in really maintaining those relationships and those notes and copious notes that he and his team would keep. And so whether it's digital or analog, I think the concept is the main point, which what are you, who are you, who are your people and are you, are you nurturing them? 